Good afternoon, and welcome back to the LaRouche Pack podcast of the Lincoln series with your host, Mike Steger, and Bob Ingram. And Bob's taken us through now an introduction and the early parts of Abraham Lincoln. For podcast four, today's, we're going to begin to, to, to um, get a better understanding of how Lincoln confronted the great crisis the nation faced. That, nation, that Lincoln recognized that not simply a, a political or policy or economic approach, but that what he was directly a part of was a deeper cultural question, a question of what civilization and human identity itself were. And I think we're beginning now to kind of get into the point of Lincoln's life becomes even the most relevant to the crisis we're confronting today, but in some ways the opportunity. Because of what Lincoln brought to us, we have a sense of how we can confront this, to rebuild a, a truly new political party, a big tent, bring in the great diversity of the American people who share one common mission for freedom, for development, for creative discovery, and to bring that quality of the nation as a nation state to the world as a whole. So hopefully you enjoy the discussion. I think at that point, Bob, I, I'll cut my remarks short and let you jump in and we'll have some fun. Okay, all right. Yeah, we'll just get going. Um, one thing I'd like to do, uh, if I don't get this right, Mike, um, you should correct me, is um, this will probably be put on the screen a couple of times during, the web, during this podcast. But uh, we welcome questions and comments. Um, and for those who are watching this on the LaRouche Pack website or who are watching it on YouTube, um, uh, you can email us questions. Um, and the email address is, I believe, podcast, P O D C A S T, at LaRoucheNet.net. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, podcast at larouchenet.net. Yeah, so uh, we uh, look forward to hearing from you. Um, the, uh, the title of this podcast is Free Speech, Free Soil, Free Men. Uh, and th the reason for that title will become apparent in a second. But what we are going to deal with today is how Abraham Lincoln created the Republican Party and how he led the nation and saved the nation in a time of great crisis and war. Um, this is obviously not simply just an academic study of history. This has great implications for what we are doing today. So before I proceed, I'd like to actually show you where the title of the podcast came from. So if you could put up that first picture, Mike. All right. This is a membership certificate in, as you can, as you can see, in uh, to certify that so-and-so is a member of the Wide Awake Club. And if you look at the top, there is the motto of the Wide Awake Club, free speech, free soil, free men. And uh, the, um, uh, uh, the Wide Awake Club was an organization, there were actually it was many clubs all over, all over the, the Union, uh, who um, during the 1960 campaign organized tens and tens of thousands of young men uh, into a um, young adults, into um, a, a political movement, uh, in, in, in many cases, a paramilitary unit uh, uh, movement um, uh, in defense of the union and in support of the, um, the Lincoln uh, uh, presidential campaign of 1860. Uh, and if you could put up the, um, the next picture, Mike, and this is a picture of a wide awake march. I believe this is in New York City, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm not 100% positive. But if you look at that picture in the middle, you could see a, 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 a big banner 
being held aloft uh, and also an American flag. But the banner is a picture of Abraham Lincoln. And it says at the top, Lincoln. And I think at the bottom, it says Hamlin, who was Lincoln's running mate for vice president. And you could see all the people in there and they're all wide awake, uh, wide awakes. They're members of the wide awake clubs uh, marching and rallying for Lincoln's uh, presidential campaign in 1860, which was not, this was not a campaign in the sense that people generally think about presidential campaigns. You know, it wasn't just an election campaign. This was a, a movement, a rallying of the American people, which the wide awake clubs were a, a key component of, uh, a, 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 you know, a rallying of the American people to save the nation, to save the Republic at a time of great, great crisis. So that is uh, why this uh, podcast is entitled Free Speech, Free Soil, Free Men. Because uh, in, a, in a very real kind of way, what we need to do today is exactly what the Wide Awake Movement did in 1860. Now, to get into this, um, you know, just to preface the, the historical remarks, um, I mean, we, we're, this is now the fourth of these podcasts, and these are being given, as I think almost all of our listeners and watchers realize, at a time of great crisis. Um, we're now only five months, five months into the, uh, or maybe it's a little more than five months, into the Biden presidency. And we are rapidly descending deeper and deeper into crisis. This is actually escalating at an astonishing rate. Um, now, you know, it, it is critical here for each of us to recognize the nature of this crisis and, and where it is coming from, where the threat to our nation, where the threat to the world is coming from. And it's not coming from Joe Biden. You know, and, and uh, you know, the, uh, you know, if people remember, and it wasn't that far back, during the presidential campaign back in October and November of last year, um, going into the election, there were all of these videos up on the internet portraying Biden as, as a, as a dummy, as someone who, you know, was being, you know, propped up by nurses and handlers who couldn't utter two words out of his mouth, who was really just sort of a, uh, 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 you know, again, a dummy who was being uh, put up as a front um, and who, you know, could not utter a coherent sentence. Well, you know, that, the, you know, those videos which ridiculed Biden at that time were accurate. And there's no reason to take a different view of Biden today. You know, um, the, the, th the threats that we're facing are not coming from Joe Biden. He reads what's on the teleprompter and usually he reads it very poorly and stumbles over it. He doesn't even know where he is half the time. What you really have to look at, you know, is not, and then certainly not Ocasio-Cortez or any of these other morons and idiots. You know, uh, on the LaRouche Pack website right now, and, and, and some of the recent videos that have been done by Barbara Boyd and, uh, and others, um, you know, we are, you know, we're, we're getting people to look at um, what happened in Davos several months ago, what happened at the you know, International Conference of the World Economic Forum. Um, you know, uh, what's happening with organizations and, and, and institutions like BlackRock. Now, wh what you're really looking at is you know, the modern British empire. Uh, you're looking at you know, a combination of 
of very powerful financial institutions, Silicon Valley tech companies, you know, the trillion dollar companies of Silicon Valley, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. Um, you're looking at uh, insider financial, uh, you know, uh, players. You're looking at the central banking system. Um, these are the uh, oligarchical interests who are now out to extinguish American sovereignty, to extinguish the very idea of what the American Republic stands for, and to impose upon both our nation and the rest of the world a brutal financial and economic dictatorship. That's where this threat is coming from. And we are in a crisis, which in many ways is unprecedented. It is certainly, and there, is, there can be no argument with this. Uh, it is certainly the gravest crisis that we have faced since the Civil War. And at the time of the Civil War, in the, in the, particularly between 1854 and 1860, um, we were facing a crisis which really raised the question of whether the American Republic was going to continue. You know, this is what Lincoln spoke so eloquently about in the Gettysburg Address. Now, we're having this podcast, you know, roughly, you know, only a day after Memorial Day weekend you know, where we had a holiday, which Cam, you know, Kamala Harris disgraced, but we had a holiday in celebration of those who gave their lives and who otherwise sacrificed in the defense of our nation. And it behooves us at this moment uh, to, to think through, to, to look at what Lincoln faced, and, and, and to try to approach the crisis we're in today, not with just anger and rage and certainly not partisan politics, but to, to recognize the threat we're facing, to recognize the struggles of the past, to recognize the crisis Lincoln was facing, and to really approach this situation we're in today with a, you know, a, a seriousness a resolution that we are going to rise to this occasion and, 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 and to do no less than what Lincoln did during his lifetime. Now, what I want to begin with is reading you a quote. And this is not a quote uh, from Abraham Lincoln. This is a quote from Donald Trump. Um, and it's from the speech that President Trump gave at Mount Rushmore last July 4th. Actually, the speech was given on July 3rd, but over the July 4th weekend. Um, and um, it was a speech he gave in honor of July 4th. So that's less than a year ago, July 4th of last year. About 11 months ago, Donald Trump uttered these words. And he said, our founders launched not only a revolution in government, but a revolution in the pursuit of justice, equality, liberty, and prosperity. No nation has done more to advance the human condition than the United States of America. And no people have done more to promote human progress than the citizens of our great nation. It was all made possible by the courage of 56 patriots who gathered in Philadelphia 244 years ago and signed the Declaration of Independence. They enshrined a divine truth that changed the world forever when they said, all men are created equal. These immortal words set in motion the unstoppable march of freedom. Our founders boldly declared 
that we are all endowed with the same divine rights given to us by our creator in heaven. And that which God has given us, we will allow no one ever to take away, ever. 1776 represented the culmination of thousands of years of Western civilization and the triumph, not only of spirit, but of wisdom, philosophy, and reason. So those are the words that Donald Trump uttered about 11 months ago. I think these are very coherent, very coherent with what Abraham Lincoln did between 1856 and 1860 uh, in the fight that he led. And I think we should take these words to heart, not as simply a nice 4th of July speech, but as sort of the motivating, the motivation for what we have to do in the weeks and months ahead. So with that, I'm gonna just jump right into the history of this. Um, I wanna begin by saying that um, between 1854 and 1860, Abraham Lincoln created the movement and created the Republican Party which saved our nation. Um, now, a lot of historians would dispute that. They'd say, well, the Republican Party was founded in Wisconsin and Michigan, and there were a lot of people involved. Yes, but it was Lincoln who organized the party around a concept, a principle in his mind. And it was the principle as understood by Lincoln which became, in fact, um, the Lincoln administration, which became the Republican Party and the Lincoln presidency. And I think that will become clear as we go through this. Now, what happened was that without going into all of the details and all of the history, which there's no time to do, but in 1854, a bill was passed in the United States Congress and signed into law by then President Franklin Pierce, I believe, um, called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Now, this had to do with slavery, and it had to do with slavery in the territories, because at that time, much of the Western United States, most of the Western United States was still territories. It was no, they were not states yet. And the question was, was slavery going to be allowed in these territories? Now, according to the Missouri Compromise of 1820, and you can look this up on the internet, I don't have pictures of it, but the Missouri Compromise drew a line across the United States and said, slavery will be prohibited north of that line, and it will be allowed south of that line. Now, this was not good enough for the slave power of the South. And they wanted to uh, establish slave states north of the Mason-Dixon line. So in 1854, they managed to get the Kansas-Nebraska bill enacted, which um, repealed the Missouri Compromise. And it, what it said, it, what it introduced was the doctrine of what they called popular sovereignty. Uh, and what popular sovereignty said is that any territory which wants to become a state can vote within that state of whether or not they're going to allow slavery. And if, and if the majority of a people in a territory vote to have slavery, then that state that territory can be brought into the Union as a slave state. Now, what this thing did uh, was essentially open up the, uh, it, what it said was that, you know, if people vote for it, 
slavery can become legal in essentially all the way from the Mexican border to the Canadian border, all the way from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean, in any of these territories, slavery could be allowed. Um, and the, uh, uh, so this radically changed the situation in the nation. Um, and uh, it, 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 you know, to say it was a wake up call would, would be an understatement. This plunged the entire nation, particularly the North, into crisis. Um, uh, the way um, Lincoln put it was that when he, um, when he heard of the, um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, of the Kansas Nebraska Act, uh, the way he reported it later is, is he said, and this is a quote, news of the act astounded us. We were thunderstruck. We were stunned because what they recognized was that if, if this went through, that in fact, slavery would take over the entire nation. And it would only be a matter of time before slavery became universal throughout the entire nation. Um, two things happened as a result of this, of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. One is that there was a, uh, is that Lincoln, who had been sort of in not, I mean, to call it political retirement would be an overstatement, but Lincoln had been in Congress from 1847 to 1849. He served one term in the United States Congress. After he left Congress in 1849, he sort of semi-retired from politics. He withdrew from active political involvement. And from 1849 to 1854, you know, he still kept his hand in politics, but he devoted almost all of his time for that five-year period to his law practice. Um, that ended when, he, when news came of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, he knew that if he did not act, the nation was going to disappear, that the Republic, as it had been founded in 1776, would cease to exist unless he um, acted. So he, uh, you know, from 1854 for the next six years, Lincoln was the only way you can describe it, he was driven by the responsibility he felt to intervene into this situation. The other thing that happened after 1854 is that the political parties began to disintegrate uh, completely, completely. They just completely split, fissured, broke apart. The Whig party disappeared. Um, and in fact, um, why don't you put up the third slide, Mike? So if you look at this, this is members of the US House of Re Representatives. So the, you know, the, the first column of numbers there is the US House of Representatives in 1853. That's one year before the Kansas Nebraska Act. And you could see there are 157 Democrats 71 Whigs, four members of what was called the Free Soil Party, the Know Nothings didn't exist really at that point, and then there were two independents, I don't know who they were. But then that's 1853. 1854 is the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Then look at Congress in the right-hand column, 1855. Democrats have gone to 82. The Whig Party has disappeared. The Free Soil Party, well, there were many people who called themselves Free Soilers, but as an organized party, they disappeared. The, the, the Know Nothings are up to 51. These are mostly 
uh, former Whigs, conservative Whigs. Um, and then people in the opposition, a hundred. Uh, in the House of Representatives in 1855, to, for all practical purposes, th th there was really no organized political parties. Um, uh, it, it, everything was falling apart. Everything was fissuring. Um, and um, I'll give you some examples of that in a minute, but you had complete, um, people knew all across the nation, particularly in the North, in the Midwest region around the great states or the great lakes, um, they knew that the political parties as they were constituted could not face this crisis that the political structures as they had existed up to that moment um, had failed, were not sufficient um, to, to, to rescue the nation from the crisis that it was in. And um, I'll, I'll give you one example of, of you know, how crazy this became. And I could give you dozens of examples, but, um, uh, there was a, uh, an election campaign in 1854 in Illinois. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and during this, this was, these are not the famous Lincoln Douglas debates. They were, that was four years later in 1858. But there was an election campaign in 1854 in Illinois. And, and Stephen Douglas, who was the Democratic senator, and who was the sponsor of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he gave speeches around the state. And what Lincoln did is Lincoln did not debate Douglas. There were no Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1854, but Lincoln followed Douglas around, around the state. And Douglas would give a speech. And either that evening or the next day, Lincoln would give a speech answering Douglas, right? And, and, and everywhere Douglas went, Lincoln followed him. And that, that pattern, you know, they followed that pattern. So um, there was one speech that Douglas gave at the state fairground in Springfield. And he gave this, you know, ringing endorsement of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The next day, Lincoln gave a speech in Springfield attacking the Kansas-Nebraska Act and attacking Douglas. Now, two newspapers covered both of these speeches. Uh, one newspaper was called the Illinois Republican and one was called the Illinois Democrat. Now, the Illinois Republican was run by a pro-slavery Whig. Remember the Whig party? but it was pro-slavery. And the Illinois Republican praised Douglas and denounced Lincoln in their coverage of these two speeches. The second newspaper that covered the two speeches was the Illinois Democrat. But the Illinois Democrat was run by a free soil Democrat who opposed slavery. And the, and the Illinois Democrat praised Lincoln and attacked Douglas. So this is what was going on. All of the party allegiances were fracturing, right? Everything was up for grabs. Um, no one really knew, you know, I mean, I'll give you one other example, which is that Lincoln's first campaign for the Senate in 1854, he ran against, uh, a Democrat named Trumbull. And Trumbull got elected as a Democrat in 1854. But three years later, he defeated Lincoln. Three years later, Trumbull switched his party registration, became a Republican, became a, you know, a, a very strong supporter of Lincoln in the 1860 presidential election. And then, in, uh, and then later on became one of the co-authors 
of the 13th Amendment banning slavery in the United States. So the, these were absolutely tumultuous political conditions that existed. And everyone knew that something had to be done if the nation was going to survive. So what happened was that Lincoln began organizing. Now, in 1854, the Republican Party, so-called, this is what all the history books tell you. The Republican Party was founded at two meetings, one in Ripon, Wisconsin, one in Michigan. But these were very small meetings. And they were made up almost entirely of abolitionists, right? Almost entirely. Um, the same thing was going on in Illinois, where Abraham Lincoln's friend, Owen Lovejoy, and Lincoln and Lovejoy were very close friends. Owen Lovejoy was a congregational minister, an abolitionist, and he wanted to organize a Republican Party in Illinois. Lincoln was in constant contact with him in 1854 and 1855, written and spoke in personal contact with Lovejoy and with some others. And he was saying, wait, what you're doing is too narrow. What you're doing is, it, it, it won't work. We have to rethink what we're doing. We have to have a broader tent, not pragmatically, but we have to, you know, you know, uh, we have to have an approach in which we can recruit the majority of people into this fight. Now, this is what Lincoln did in 1854 and 1855 and 1856. He was organizing. He was speaking. He was traveling. He was meeting with people. Um, first in Illinois, but then as you get into 1856, 57, 58, he's touring all over the place. He's going to Ohio, he's going to Indiana, he's going to Michigan. You know, he's the one organizing this. And the, um, now, he didn't do it by saying, we're gonna, you know, the way people would do it today, by saying, we're gonna find some combination of issues. You know, we're gonna take this plank, and we're gonna take this plank, and we're gonna take this plank, and we're gonna cobble something together, kind of like you know, identity politics, the way they do it today. It's a little bit for everyone. That's not what he did. He did the opposite. So, they, and I'll, I'll tell you, and I'll go through exactly what he did do. But the, um, uh, this all culminated in, um, in May, the end of May, 1856, where a convention was organized uh, and it met in um, Bloomington, Illinois. And this was the convention to found the Illinois Republican Party. Lincoln was the organizer of the convention. I had a quote here, but I won't read you the quote from one of the leading participants of the convention who says, yeah, there were, this person was involved and that person was involved. But the person says, Lincoln was the one. Lincoln was the one who held it together. Lincoln was the one that everyone rallied around. And that was the convention in Bloomington. Now, I'll read you from a speech. I'm gonna read several quotes from Lincoln, but I'm gonna read you from a speech that Lincoln gave one week, one week before the Bloomington convention convened. So this is, you know, this is Lincoln's thinking as you know, he's one week away from the founding of the Illinois Republican Party. And what Lincoln says is the following. He says, we are here to stand firmly for a principle, to stand firmly for a right. We know that great political and moral wrongs are done and outrages are committed. And we denounce those wrongs and outrages. As it now stands, we must appeal to the sober sense and patriotism of the people 
We will make converts day by day. We will grow strong by calmness and moderation. We will grow strong by the violence and injustices of our adversaries. And unless truth be mockery and justice a hollow lie, we will be in the majority after a while. And then the revolution which we will accomplish will be nonetheless radical from being the result of pacific measures. The battle of freedom is to be fought out on principle. Slavery is a violation of the eternal right. We have temporized with it from the necessities of our condition, but as sure as God reigns and school ch children read, that black foul lie can never be consecrated into God's hollow, hallowed truth. So I'm going to read you another quote from him in a second. But Lincoln is saying, leave the violence, leave the, the rage, leave the outrages to our adversaries. They discredit themselves by doing it. We will act calmly. We will act soberly. And most importantly, we will act on principle and we will recruit people on that basis. Now, what happened at the convention, this convention in Bloomington, is there were people there from all the whole political spectrum. This is in Bloomington, May of 1856. There were members of the Whig Party. There were members of the Democratic Party. There were free soilers. There were abolitionists. There were know-nothings. There were various immigrant groups, Germans, Swedish, Irish immigrants. And, you know, it was, it was an uproar because they could agree on almost nothing. You know, the free soilers were against slavery, uh, uh, but they were for low tariffs. The Whigs were for tariffs, but a lot of them were pro-slavery. Other people had this and that. And, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, tumultuous to say the least. Um, at a certain point, when it, it looked like the, the, the convention might break apart, they sent for Lincoln and Lincoln gave a speech. And this speech, it was, and, and this is known as Lincoln's lost speech because unfortunately he, he did not write it out and no one in the audience wrote it down as he was giving it. In fact, some of the reporters said that the, 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 they reported that the reason they didn't write it down was because they dropped their pencils, dropped their pads. They, they were so entranced by what Lincoln was saying that they, they, you know, they, 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 couldn't, they, they couldn't listen to Lincoln and write at the same time. But Lincoln gave a speech and from what was reported on it, what he said, uh, well, there were a couple of quotes given later, but um, the, um, uh, you know, th there was a couple of paraphrases or people, you know, later reported some quotes from the speech. But what he said is that we are going to base this political party we're, we're, forget program, he, forget things that divide us. He said, we are going to base our movement and our party on one thing and one thing alone, one thing, the Declaration of Independence. We are going to stand for the Declaration of Independence and we are gonna return our nation to the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Now that may sound, people might go, oh yeah, sure, uh-huh, what, you know, that sounds good. But that, that's what they did. This was not just talk. In fact, one of the things they did was when they wrote up the Constitution, 
of the Illinois Republican Party. At Lincoln's insistence, they wrote, that is, they literally wrote down into the Constitution of the Illinois Republican Party the entire Declaration of Independence, 1776, that the Declaration of Independence of 1776 is included in the Constitution of the Illinois Republican Party of 1856. This is what they said. And the um, and Lincoln said it is on this basis that we are going to save the nation. It is on this basis that we are going to build our movement and build our party. Well, a lot of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this, and I don't want to keep talking forever, but a, a, lot, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this is going to deal with slavery, um, because this was the overriding issue. You know, um, I mean, you know, the, um, I will say this, you know, uh, the, the next podcast is going to be on um, greenbacks and national banking. And we're gonna, we're gonna deal with how Lincoln addressed that crisis once he became president of the United States. But a lot of people may not be aware of the fact that between 1854, and 1861, when he was inaugurated as president, for a period of almost seven years, Lincoln almost never mentioned economic policy. And you can go back and look at all of his speeches from those six to seven years. Um, uh, you know, you, you could look at what he wrote, what he said, the counsel he gave others. Um, 1856, 57, 58, 59, he never mentions the National Bank. He never mentions internal improvements. He never mentions protective tariffs. Now, that doesn't mean he abandoned these things. And you could see what he did when he became president, you know. But Lincoln recognized that the crisis that the nation was facing could that that the that, that country could not be saved simply by enumerating a program that it was not sufficient that 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 the the, the crisis was too deep the threat to the nation the, the, they were on the verge the precipice of the united states of america disappearing of losing everything that people had lost their lives for in the Revolutionary War, that the soldiers had suffered through Valley Forge for. They were on the verge of losing everything. And they could not save the nation simply by enumerating a program that, they, that people had to be re-recruited as they were recruited in 1775. People had to be re-recruited. Lincoln's generation had to be recruited in the same way that a, the generation of 1775 had to be recruited to the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And that's what they did. That's what Lincoln did. Um, and the, um, um, the, um, um, and that really, you know, I think it is my view that has a lot of relevance for what we're doing today. I mean, you could look at what we're seeing here coming out of the Biden administration, the World Economic Forum, everything. I mean, they literally mean to extinguish the United States today as a sovereign nation to extinguish any concept or any meaning. It goes beyond just the lies and the atrocity of critical race theory, but to extinguish the very essence of, of the American Republic and, and the role America needs to play in the world today, to, to make that vanish. And um, I, I think the, uh, the challenge we're facing is very similar 
to what Lincoln faced between 1854 and 1861. So what I want to discuss next, what I, what I want to get into um, is this question of, of Lincoln and slavery. Um, because the, uh, um, this became the dominant, the, you know, the dominant issue um, from 1854 on. And there's a lot of stories, there's a lot of lies and everything else about Lincoln and slavery. So I, wa I wanna get into this a little bit. And this is gonna involve um, several quotations from Lincoln. Um, and I'm gonna actually begin with um, uh, one of the speeches he gave. This is actually in one of the speeches he gave in 1854 when he was following Douglas around uh, Illinois and uh, giving these speeches where he was replying to Douglas. So this is a speech he gave at Springfield in October of 1854. And um, what Lincoln says is the following. No man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent. I say, that this is the leading principle, the sheet anchor of American republicanism. Our revolutionary fathers understood that slavery was wrong. For practical reasons, they could not eradicate it at the time they set up the new national government, but they hedged and hemmed it in to the narrowest limits of necessity. They did not allow the word slavery in the Constitution, but permitted only indirect references to it, just as an afflicted man hides away a cancer, which he dares not cut out at once, lest he bleed to death, with the promise, nevertheless, that the cutting may begin at the end of a given time. Now, also in 1854, in another speech that Lincoln gave in reply to Douglas, this one at Peoria, uh, Lincoln said the following, slavery is founded in the selfishness of man's nature. Opposition to it uh, in his love of justice. These principles are in eternal antagonism and when brought into collision, so fiercely as slavery extension brings them, shocks and throes and convulsions must ceaselessly follow. Our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us purify it. Let us turn and wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood of the revolution. Let us readopt the Declaration of Independence, and with it, the practices and policy which harmonize with it. So, again, Lincoln is directly referencing the Declaration of Independence as the way out of this crisis. And, and you know, he, he's recruiting. He's recruiting. I mean, this is this problem today with you get people who, you know, just say, you know, I'm a Republican, I'm a Republican, I'm a Republican. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I don't know if that's anything to be proud of. I mean, what, what, what are you saying? I'm a Republican. Does that mean you, mo you voted for George Bush? Does that mean you voted for John McCain? Does that mean you voted for Mitt Romney? I mean, there's nothing to be proud of you know, in what the Republican Party has been doing over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, the, uh, uh, I mean, one must remember that when Trump ran for president in 2016, he ran against the established Democratic Party and he ran against the established Republican Party, Jeb Bush and others. Um, you know, what we are out to do, and I believe what Trump has been out to do, is to take over the Republican Party. 
and to create a new Republican Party as Lincoln created a new Republican Party and to recruit Democrats, independents and working people to this new party. Um, and in, <laughs> in that process, in February of 1857, uh, while Lincoln is doing all of this organizing all over the Midwest, uh, Lincoln gave a speech in February 28, 1857. And in the audience, there were all these people from all of these parties, Whigs, Democrats, know nothings, free soilers. And what Lincoln said was, let bygones be bygones. Let past differences as nothing be. And with steady eye, on the real issue, let us re-inaugurate the good old central ideas of our republic. We can do it. The human heart is with us. God is with us. We shall again be able not to declare that all states are equal, nor yet that all citizens are equal, but to renew the broader, better, original declaration that all men are created equal. So that was in February of 1857. Um, the, um, um, the, uh, then in that same year, about actually a week, 10 days after Lincoln gave that speech, um, on March 6th of 1857, the crisis took a gigantic downward plunge. I mean, the crisis, uh, the crisis that Lincoln had been organizing around, you know, in the midst of, um, got incredibly worse because uh, in, in March, on March 6th of 1857, the Supreme Court handed down the Dred Scott decision. Now, the Dred Scott decision, um, which had to do with a runaway slave, I'm not gonna go into the decision itself. It's very well known. People can, who are not familiar with it can look it up. Um, but it essentially, what the Supreme Court ruled was two things, two basic things. Number one, that no blacks, including in the North, could be American citizens. That the, the, the US Constitution, the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution, in essence, prohibited black citizenship. Even in Massachusetts, even in New York, um, and in many of these states, blacks were citizens at that time. In many of these states, blacks voted in elections at that time. And the Dred Scott decision said, this is unlawful. The second thing the Dred Scott decision said is that if slave owners um, uh, brought slaves into a free state or a free territory, that those, th th those slaves still remain their property that property rights as guaranteed by the constitution, at least the Dred Scott decision interpretation of the constitution, that property rights took precedence over state law and that slave owners could bring their slaves into uh, anywhere they wanted. So essentially what that meant is that if thousands of slave owners in the South wanted to move to Massachusetts or New York or Illinois or anywhere else, they could bring their slaves, introduce their slaves into these Northern states and that essentially slavery could become universal everywhere, regardless of what the individual state said. So this obviously took the crisis that had existed with the, you know, following the Kansas Nebraska Act and took it in, into a, a much, much worse, much more dangerous, you know, catastrophic direction. Um, the, um, now, uh, 
you know, in, in response to that, Lincoln gave his famous House divided speech. Lincoln was nominated to run for the US Senate um, in, um, in Illinois. And he gave, uh, in accepting the nomination of the Republican Party nomination to run for a Senate in 1858, he gave his famous House divided speech. Now, it's a very long speech. And I encourage everyone who's watching this webcast to read the entirety of that speech. Um, it is readily available on the internet. Just simply look up um, Lincoln 1858 House Divided speech. Um, but I'm going to read a short section from it here. Uh, and uh, similarly, I'm going to read a short section from one of the Lincoln Douglas debates later in 1858. So this is the speech that Lincoln gives in June where he accepts the Republican nomination to run for US Senate. He says, I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it, will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as, old as well as new, north as well as South. We may ere long see another Supreme Court decision declaring that the Constitution of the United States does not permit a state to exclude sla slavery from its limits. Well, that's essentially what the Dred Scott did in essence, but Lincoln is saying here that there could be a formal Supreme Court decision saying that. Um, such a decision is all that slavery now lacks of being alike lawful in all the states. Welcome or unwelcome, such a decision is probably coming and will soon be upon us unless the power of the present political dynasty shall be met and overthrown. To meet and overthrow the power of that dynasty is the work now before all of those who would prevent that consummation. That is what we have to do. We shall not fail if we stand firm. We shall not fail. Wise counsels may accelerate or mistakes may delay it, but sooner or later, the victory is sure to come. So that's Lincoln's speech or part of it, accepting the nomination for Senate. So these are not election campaigns that Lincoln is running, you know, per se. You know, this is the recruitment of the American people into a victorious movement, a political army to save the nation. Um, now I'll read you, you know, the, 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 you know, during the 1858 campaign, you have the famous Lincoln Douglas debates. Um, I'm not gonna say much about them uh, here in this podcast, but I'm gonna just read to you one very short section from the final debate. Um, the, uh, um, this is at Alton, Alton, Illinois um, on uh, October 15th, 1858. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's in this final closing debate that Lincoln really reduces the issue facing the nation, the issue of that election to its most essential moral imperative. Um, and Lincoln says the following, is slavery wrong? That is the real issue. That is the issue that will continue in this country when these poor tongues of Judge Douglas and myself shall be silent. It is the eternal struggle 
between these two principles of right and wrong throughout the world. They are two principles that have stood face to face from the beginning of time and will ever continue to struggle. The one is the common right of humanity and the other is the divine right of kings. It is the same principle in whatever shape it develops itself. It is the same spirit that says, you work and toil and earn bread and I'll eat it. No matter in what shape it comes, whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his own nation and live by the fruit of their labor, or from one race of men as an apology for enslaving another race, it is the same tyrannical principle. And that's the end of the quote. And all I would interject here is that this is exactly reduced to forget the trappings, forget you know all of everything else in its moral essence. This is exactly the same thing that Lyndon LaRouche repeatedly talked about throughout his life as the oligarchical principle. Um, and this is what we see again today in, in, the, on, in the escalating effort to destroy our nation. Um, so look, there's, there's a lot that is said about Lincoln and slavery, a lot of lies that are said. But even people who defend who, who defend Lincoln on this, for a lot of people, they're not really clear on this issue. So all I want to say in, 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 in sort of bringing my remarks to a close is, is to, you know, dispel some of the misconceptions people have and, 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 and to make very clear for everyone, um, you know, not only Lincoln's views on slavery, but the, 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 how morally Lincoln dealt with slavery um, within himself. Now, Lincoln hated slavery. He abhorred it, uh, you know, from, from a very young age. His parents were abolitionists. I mean, they weren't active abolitionists, but they were vehemently anti-slavery, did not think slavery should exist just for religious reasons. His father, his mother, then his stepmother. Um, you know, they uh, were poor whites. They had come out of the South from Kentucky. They hated slavery. Um, the um, Lincoln, you know, there was slavery around him somewhat, when he was growing up, although he spent most of his, you know, he moved to Indiana when he was very young. And when he was living in Indiana, he didn't have a lot of encounters with slave with slavery. He, um, his first real encounter was when he was 19 years old, when he was, uh, had a couple of jobs on uh, taking cargo down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, um, you know, on flat boats and stuff, delivering cargo. And he traveled to New Orleans and uh, he was with a friend of his name, Gentry. And Gentry reported late, later, they, I mean, they came across um, um, a, a slave auction. There were half naked young, uh, uh, you know, black women or black girls who were being, you know, auctioned off and pinched and groped and everything. And, and according to Gentry, Lincoln, you know, just turned to him and said, uh, you know, this is horrific. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he was just absolutely uh, horrified by what they were witnessing. Um, um, then two years later, he made, he was hired to take another boatload of cargo to New Orleans. This time he traveled with a, a different friend, a guy named John Hanks. And again, um, they, they, they traveled around, uh, you know, after they delivered their cargo, they were walking around New Orleans and what have you. They came across uh, a slave auction. 
They came across slaves being led through the street, manacled, whipped, scourged, chained. And, um, and Hanks uh, wrote to someone on this and said that, um, that Lincoln was just overcome. And, and, and he said, and I'm just, I'm quoting here, that Lincoln's heart bled, that he was silent from feeling uh, incredible sadness took over his countenance. He was abstracted. Um, uh, uh, and, um, you know, one, uh, you know, one report said that, you know, after seeing some of this, Lincoln ran away and they came across him later and found him weeping. Um, Lincoln had this deep moral revulsion. And what Hanks wrote is that he said it was on this 1831 trip that, quote, Lincoln formed his opinions of slavery and it ran its iron through him then and there. Um, the, um, and, uh, you know, in 1841, Lincoln wrote a letter to Joshua Speed in Kentucky. Joshua Speed was this friend of his who was a slave owner in Kentucky. And Lincoln wrote a friend to him saying that every time he came, he visited Kentucky, that it was, he, he found he couldn't, he almost couldn't go there. He said it was uh, every time I crossed over into Kentucky and saw these people in bondage, he said it was a continual torment to me. I couldn't bear it. Um, the, uh, now, when Lincoln was elected to the Illinois legislature in 1837, um, they had, slavery was illegal in Illinois, but they had what were called black codes. Uh, and these black codes, you know, they weren't as bad as the Jim Crow laws in the South in the 1890s, but they restricted what, you know, what free blacks could do. Um, they couldn't vote, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. Uh, and Lincoln introduced a bill to repeal all of the black codes, to eliminate them entirely in Illinois. Um, and there were a hundred members of the Illinois legislature. And when Lincoln introduced the bill, he could only get one co-sponsor out of the hundred. So Lincoln stood virtually alone trying to eliminate the black codes. Later, when he was also in the legislature, um, there was a resolution introduced to um, uh, condemn, you know, sort of as a resolution to condemn the abolitionists to condemn the abolition movement. And Lincoln gave a speech saying that he would only vote to condemn the abolitionists if, if the resolution also included a condemnation of slavery. And of course they wouldn't do that. So the resolution was brought up for a vote and it was passed 77 to six uh, condemning the abolitionists and Lincoln was one of the six voting against it. Uh, Lincoln's, most of Lincoln's closest friends in Illinois, by the time you get into the late 1840s and early 1850s, most of the people he was the closest to were the abolitionists. Owen Lovejoy was one of his, was very close to him and many of the others. He was generally con seen by the Democrats and attacked by the Democrats as an abolitionist, the conservative Whigs attacked him as an abolitionist. He would just, he would not go along with the abolitionists because he said, we can't just found a party based on abolition. It had already been tried with the Liberty Party. And, and you know, he said, we can't do that. We're about to lose the nation. We've got to get to the heart of the issue. Slavery is, 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 is in one sense at the heart of the issue because slavery is such an egregious violation of the Declaration of Independence. But what we have to get at is the principle of the Declaration of Independence around which we rally everyone to save the nation. So the, um, now when Lincoln went to Congress 
he served two term he served one term in Congress. He was there for two years. And while he was in Congress, he voted for every in favor of every single anti-slavery motion that was put before the Congress. There was this thing called the Wilmot Proviso, which would have outlawed slavery in all of the territories that we had taken from Spain in the Spanish-American War. Um, Lincoln, every time that this came up for a vote on numerous occasions, because it was passed, then it didn't go through, then it was brought up again. And every time the Wilmot Proviso was brought up for a vote, Lincoln voted in favor of it. Um, he, he, every other resolution that came up for a vote, he, uh, re, in regards to opposing slavery, he voted for it. Um, in the, um, and then Lincoln did something which no one else had done. There had been various proposals to ban the slave trade, you know, the buying and selling of slaves in Washington, D.C., because, you know, Washington was below the Mason-Dixon line and there were slaves in Washington. And there were various pieces of legislation to try to ban the slave trade in Washington, D.C. And Lincoln said, this is not good enough. This is not good enough. Even though we're below the Mason-Dixon line, Washington, D.C. is federal territory. So Lincoln introduced a bill to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C., which Congress had the authority to do. And Lincoln introduced a bill to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. He was the only member of Congress to introduce a bill to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. And it didn't pass. But, you know, this idea that, you know, Lincoln only freed the slaves for pragmatic reasons, Lincoln only in the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free the slaves in the South, this is all lies and garbage of revisionist historians. Um, Lincoln's hatred and opposition to slavery was so deep, as, as, as John Holt reported, it ran through him like iron. And this gets to the heart. See, in in uh, uh, th this might shock some people. What I'm about to say next, some 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 people who know a little bit about Henry Carey and the American system of economics. Um, there was a financial panic in the United States in 1857, uh, and and you know certain financial institutions went bankrupt. Uh, a lot of businesses went went bankrupt. A lot of people were thrown out of work. This is in 1857. So the Republican Party was organized 1856. You know, it was it's getting going all, all 1856, 57, 58. The Republican Party is getting going all over the country. And um, and the, the Whig Party has disappeared. It no longer exists. And so they're they're going into the election of 1856, 1858. They're going into the election of 1858. And uh, with this big crisis in the country, economic crisis, Henry Carey and a number of other leaders of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, of the Republican Party said, "Look, we've got this big economic crisis, which has been brought about because of the ruinous economic policies of the Democrats. We should we should." make this the focus of the 1858 election. We should mobilize the nation around, the, around an economic program in the 1858 election. That's what Henry Carey and that's what a bunch of other people wanted to do. Um, you know who said no to that? Lincoln. Lincoln said no. And in fact, he gave a speech in 1858 where he says, like it or not, slavery is the issue before us, right? Now, that did not mean Lincoln had abandoned all of the economic policies he fought for. And we'll see what next week, what he did in some of this. But he knew that program 
they had gone beyond mobilizing people simply around programs. That 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 uh, uh, it wouldn't work. It didn't. It didn't. You know, it, that something far. You know that you had to go to the heart of the matter, and that's uh, you know that's what Lincoln did. So um, uh, the uh, I think I will stop there, and um, there's a lot more that I could say. Um, I, I hope that people have gotten some of out of something out of this, uh, but uh, why don't I stop and we can open it up for discussion, Mike? Yeah, great, great. Um, you know, one of the things that stands out when you look at look at these quotes, um, um, you know, I could read like this one. You said this is a Lincoln speech to Senator Douglas when he's following him around town, I guess, 1854. Mm -hmm. uh, so he says, slavery is founded in the selfishness of man's nature, opposition to it in his love of justice. These principles are an eternal antagonism. And when brought into collision so fiercely as slavery extension brings them, shocks and throws and convulsions must ceaselessly follow. You know, I think, because what defines what was my first real political encounter or encounter with a real political conception uh, was on the question of globalization. And globalization at that time was seen for what it was. Today, it's seen for the, the financial centers it's built up. And within these financial centers, these kind of cultural cults with their rainbow flags and their Black Lives Matter and their various kinds of pot legalizations and all the cultural destruction that's taking place within them but they're very they can be very fancy financial centers i mean it could be abu dhabi it could be certain major coastal provinces in china certainly in europe you know everything's turned into like a disneyland resort but in the 90s globalization was seen for what it was the pursuit of cheap labor it was an outright pursuit of finding where could i find the cheapest labor possible labor that might be children it would be the sweatshops, the maquilladoras in Mexico. It was the pursuit of cheap labor. And of course, the cheapest labor is slavery. But in some cases, even the slaveholders knew if we could, if we could, didn't have to, well, I mean, there's, there's different ways of putting it, but it was, it was a slavery policy. And what stands out today when you take globalism from that standpoint, that it is a push to eradicate nations in the pursuit of the cheapest form of, of labor possible. That you could read these quotes and say, globalism is founded in the selfishness of man's nature, opposition to it in his love of justice. And I think that it's hard not to see that this question of sovereignty that you referenced at the beginning with Trump and his speech on the 4th of July and of last year, that these are the same questions that, that what Lincoln confronted, though it's different, you know, in some ways he says, the house divided cannot stand. We are either all one thing or all another. Well, either we are going to be all, a, we are going to be all in a system of cheap labor and corporations, global corporations like BlackRock in the Davos Forum operation, or is the world is going to be a, a world of sovereign nations? Those are the choices. And that nations intrinsically then have a responsibility to their people to raise the standard of labor, to raise the standard of quality of thought, to raise the powers of production or the powers of labor, as, as Lynn used to put it. Um, but that's the responsibility of a nation. A global corporation doesn't. That's what pushes the slavery. And it's very hard not to hear what Lincoln's saying. And when you look at the, the way he captured the economic questions as a, as a fundamental principle, not as a system of policy formulations, but at the core question of what's at stake, it's hard for me in, in thinking through what we're confronting today not to see that. So you've, you've, you've watched, I mean, you followed the Davos conference closely. I know you've thought about this question. So maybe... I'm raising what I'm raising to hear maybe what you have to say. Maybe I'm, I'm a little bit 
on one side or the other, but let's, I want to hear what you think. Well, yeah, I mean, well, I think you put it very well. Um, you know, the, uh, I mean, it is that. I mean, you, this. Uh, you, I mean, you mentioned the one quote from Lincoln, but the other one that I read uh, from uh, the um, debate at uh, Alton in um, 1858, where Lincoln says, um, "It is the eternal struggle between these two principles, and the common right of humanity and the divine right of kings." Um, and uh, you know, I mean. This this is this is the issue and national sovereignty, you know the. Um, well, I mean, I, all I could say is I think I, I think you put it very well. The. I mean, what you have, I mean, to a certain extent, it, it's kind of funny. I didn't read that part, but the, uh, you did, um, where it says we're going to become all one thing or all the other. I mean, I mean. You, you could make an analogy. I mean, maybe this is not a good analogy, but you could make an analogy that, you know, over the recent period, or or certainly since um, certainly since 1971, you might want to go back earlier, but certainly since the end of the Bretton Woods system in 1971, you know, the United States has been part of one thing and part of another. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know we've had the institutions of our republic we've had to one degree or another a certain amount of national sovereignty but then as we moved into you know the era of globalization the world trade organization um you know the the uh, uh, financialization of the economy as you said the creation of these corporations i mean you you look at the corporations that we're at, at Davos, uh, you know, at, we're at the World Economic Forum. I mean, virtually none of these organizations can, uh, corporations, I forget where their legal headquarters are, forget, you know, whether they're, they're legally registered in this country or that country, it's, it's all meaningless now. Um, you get these trillion dollar corporations or corporations worth hundreds of billions of dollars, um, these are nations, these are corporations or banks or financial institutions, which operate outside of any nation state whatsoever. Um, uh, you know, and the, um, and this has been what has been um, gradually step by step by step, uh, moving in to take control of every nation in the world, all policy making, all economic policy, um, you know, uh, over the last 30 to 40 years. And we've been, it, it's almost um, like, you know, I, I mean, you know, I began this web, this podcast in 1854 with the Kansas Nebraska Act, but you could go back earlier to 1850, the compromise of 1850. You'd even go back to the compromise of 1820. I mean, step by step, you know, um, what you saw in those decades leading up to the Civil War was was two different things, two different phenomena, living side by side within the borders of one nation. Um, and step by step, the one, particularly after 1854, in an escalating fashion was threatening to take over the entire nation. And that's, you know, you can make an analogy that this is what we've been seeing in our time. This is what we've been seeing over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And, and obviously now, you know, it's escalating. And they think since they've gotten Trump out of office, um, that they are going to be able to just go all out with this. You know, it, it, you referenced this, um, the, the Nebraska Act, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 54, um, the, the Dred Scott decision, uh, I guess I think that's in 57 or 58. 57. 57. You also have the economic crisis. Right. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's actually two thoughts, but one, the first one, which just to develop it 
um, is that what we've been seeing, the, the exposure of the fraud of the Iraq war, you know, I just thought about it today, when you think back to the coverage, you know, part of the exposure of, you know, people have a question, why, why is Liz Cheney the way she is? Why is she so messed up? Why is she such against this country? Well, the reality is maybe she was tortured by her father. I mean, maybe she was actually tortured because that's what this was, ha that's what was happening. Not only did they lie, they then deployed the American intelligence agencies and military personnel into a program that was synonymous with the slave system. That's what Cheney and Bush were pushing. And they could barely feed the American soldiers with their Halliburton rackets. They, and the American people rejected this as early as the 2006 election. They overwhelmingly supported the first black president. Well, he wasn't really black, I and mean, that's a different question, but they came out supportive of Obama because they thought he would come and end the war program, that he would end this economic devastation of the country to some extent. There was these hopes and you know, he referenced Lincoln, he would reference FDR. The American people have been mobilizing for this but of course they bought into the housing bubble. They opposed the bailouts. So with the Iraq war, the lies, the destruction of our military personnel, of our citizens that were deployed there, then you had the bailouts pushed uniquely by Obama. I mean, Obama, before he was even president, mm -hmm. pushed it just to be clear. Um, he even told the Black Caucus to kick off their bedroom slippers and get in line. I think that's a near verbatim quote. But you had these you had these incidents that were building that I mean the American people in that September October period of 2007 rallied to the phones and called their congressmen and said with pitchforks don't do the bailout no that's not what we support if these banks lost let them go back up the deposits back up what do we have for the FDIC insured deposits let the banks go and of course, a week later, when Dick Cheney, the, the, you know, comes through and basically tells people to F off on the House floor and threatens, as I think it was Brad Sherman, but threatened martial law if they didn't ram it through. So Congress just rammed it through a week later, and the American people were stunned, much like you had with the, the Dred Scott decision, just stunned, and recognized that if they're going to do this, our nation's going to be torn to pieces. And literally, it nearly was over those eight years of Obama. And so Trump comes into office expressing a commitment to end this insanity. And they run Russiagate, an ongoing coup run by our intelligence agencies and the British intelligence operation. And then, of course, they then steal the election. But it, you see these kinds of culminating of events building into the, the American people recognizing this is now an existential question. And um, it just, it's, it, uh, I, there was another point I wanted to make, but it just, it is somewhat just to see the parallels of these crises and how they develop. I mean, the American people were against the lies of the Iraq war. They were against the bailouts. They were against the torture. They mobilized against it. But here, their, their Republican and Democratic reps sat there ignoring their wishes, ignoring their clamor, election after election after election, and ultimately putting the, the nation in a crisis. Oh, this is the other point, you know, the question of these corporations. And so you can, you might want to, if you can, you can address, you know, what, how you see this process, because you've been participating in this, this contemporary period, you know, over the last 45, 50 years. But the other thing that you've done extensive research on, Bob, is, and what you didn't mention today, because this is more a discussion of Lincoln, but that this system of slavery was actually created. This was a specific in creation of a globalist system at the time. This was specifically intended to undermine the formation of an independent nation, to undermine the ferment of the early colonies in the 1640s and 50s to create a dependency on cheap labor because it was understood by that, by the, whether it's the British India Company or the Dutch companies or, or various European powers, that such a dependence would undermine the very basis of what could be a, a different kind of nation state. So I think, I think you're uniquely capable of, 
you might want to address that. Well, sure. I, you know, the, uh, I mean, look, the, uh, it, it, it's exactly what you said. I mean, look, the, 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 the first slaves that were brought in, I mean, first of all, without going into the history of slavery uh, and, and, and uh, all over the world, um, the, the uh, you know, African slaves began to be brought into the Western Hemisphere first by the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire, and then later by the Dutch Empire. These were empires. Um, uh, you know, these were, uh, th this was imperial rule, oligarchical rule. Um, you know, the, uh, the Portuguese set up all the slave fortresses in Africa, um, et cetera, et cetera. The Dutch took them over later. The first slaves brought into the, uh, the North American colonies uh, were brought in first in Virginia and New York, uh, Virginia and New York City. And both of those original shipments of slaves were brought in by the Dutch West India Company. Uh, later, you know, the British took it over. Um, this was policy. This was a matter of policy, imperial policy. Um, look, not only, first of all, the United States didn't even exist at this time, you know, in the 17th century or most of the 18th century. When slaves were brought over, they were brought to the colonies. Uh, there were no Americans you know, uh, here in, you know, they, we, everyone was a British subject. Um, by the mid, you know, 18th century, almost all of the colonies had royal governors. Uh, po trade policy for the colonies was run by the Board of Trade or the Privy Council in London. The slave trade was run under the authority and auspices of the British monarchy. Um, uh, you know, the, the uh, in fact, when you get into after the um, after the um, actually it started before this, but particularly after the uh, French and Indian War, when you get into the 1750s, 1760s, you, you begin to get a repeated uh, a, a series of, of state legislature or not state colonial legislatures, colonial legislatures who passed resolutions, um, which they sent to London saying, we, you know, uh, we want you to ban the slave trade. We want no more slaves. And this included colonies in the South. Uh, Virginia passed resolutions several times calling for an end to the slave trade. This is before the Revolutionary War. And the, um, they, they wanted to stop the slaves from coming in. And in, in every case, I mean, the state, the colonial legislatures could pass these laws, but um, they had no authority to enact them. Uh, they would pass, they weren't laws, they were resolutions. So, you know, some, uh, a colony like Pennsylvania or Virginia would pass a resolution saying, you know, um, we want to stop the importation of slaves into our colony. That resolution would then go to the royal governor who would forward it to London, where it would go before the Board of Trade or Parliament or the Privy Council, where it was rejected uh, and the, uh, in every single case. Um, it was colonial policy to, to bring slaves here. And, the, and it would have, you know, if the, if the Revolutionary War hadn't occurred, it probably would have uh, escalated because the, um, this is what the Spanish did and the Portuguese did in South America. The idea was you were going to run uh, the economy based on slave labor. Um, you did not want, say, you did not want a colony. You did not want, you know, colonies in which you had educated laborers, educated citizens. You, you, you know, you, I mean, if you think of the Massachusetts Bay Colony or the Plymouth Colony, or you know, uh, in certain ways, the you know Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, uh, you know, or in certain ways, New York, where you got colonies of free people, free laborers, free residents, you know, who were working, who were building, you know, uh, 
you know, iron foundries, or iron yeah. foundries, and ships, and roads, and sawmills, and developing skills, and and setting up schools to educate their children. You did not want that if you were the people running the British Empire or the French Empire or the Spanish Empire, the Portuguese Empire. You didn't want free, self-sufficient citizens, you know, who were developing their own industry, their own science, their own education. What you wanted was to run these things through slave labor. Um, and, um, and that was the policy. And the, uh, um, you know, the, uh, um, uh, it started in South America, it was started in the Caribbean, then in South America, in Brazil, massive slave plant plantations set up by these imperial governments. And then the British brought it in, well, the Dutch brought it into New Amsterdam, but then the British brought it in in a major way. The British tried to turn New York City uh, in the early 18th century uh, they tried to turn New York City into the biggest slave trading city in North America. Mm. That was done by the British Crown, by the British Privy Council, by the Board of Trade to turn New York City into the biggest slave trading, not just most slaves, but where slaves would be bought and sold. This was done on orders that came from London. Um, they wanted a colonial system based on slavery. And now uh, it's just now it's Sir Michael Bloomberg. Yeah, right. And, you know, in a similar kind of way, that is what these, uh, you know, I mean, well, first of all, that is what people revolted against. And as Lincoln says here, and as is clearly, clearly provable, provable um, at the time of the American Revolution, you know, the leaders of that revolution uh, and most of the people involved in that revolution knew that slavery was wrong and they knew that it had to be done away with. Um, that they knew that the principles of the Declaration of Independence applied to everyone. Lincoln says this, um, you know, uh, people at the time of the American Revolution understood this, that it applied to everyone, that slavery had to be done away with, that it was a product of living under imperial rule of the British Empire. Slavery was the policy of the British Empire, not the policy of the American citizenry. And the American Re Americans at the time of the American Revolution knew that slavery had to go. Um, and, you know, it is just after Hamilton was assassinated, after um, Washington died after the Revolutionary War um, generation died away. Um, you know, uh, the, you know, the slave interests sort of fought their way back. And, and the only reason really why they could succeed um, is because of the development of the cotton economy in the South. And the cotton economy in the South was created by the British Empire. It was financed by London banks. Uh, it, the cotton was bought by London merchants. The transformation of the South into a giant slave plantation. It was essentially a, you know, it was a copy. It was a copy of what had been done with the sugar plantations in the Caribbean, uh, you know, 100, 200 years earlier, when they set up all the sugar plantations in Jamaica and Barbados and what have you, and brought in all the African slaves in the sugar plantations, um, you know, all they did was they copied that model in the South. Um, and it was all financed by the British. And they created essentially two nations or two societies, two cultures within the United States after 1800. And, um, and this was all done by the British, and and uh, and then and then as you get towards, you know, 1850, 1860, you know, um, they take what they've created, and uh, you know they're at a point where they can literally um, uh, bring down the United States, where they can reverse the American Revolution, right? You know, and 
isn't that like where we're at today? I mean, I mean, you know, isn't isn't this process? I mean, giving globalization is a is a bad term. It, I mean, it's a term that everyone knows, but isn't this sort of dictatorship of you know supranational corporations and 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 central banks and financial institutions? Uh, isn't this a system of slavery, which they're now trying to spread all over the world? You know, I mean, I mean, all this talk about, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, there is no intention. I mean, you could see it in the green policy. You could see it in the green policy. Outlaw carbon emissions, you know, uh, reduce carbon emissions by 50%, 80%, what have you. Um, don't allow fossil fuels, don't allow nuclear power, just have appropriate technology, you know, in India or in Africa or anywhere else. I mean, it's a policy of, of, of uh, um, I mean, we've called it a Malthusian policy. It is a Malthusian policy, but it is um, uh, a policy to prohibit to prohibit human advancement, to prohibit scientific uh, advancement, to prohibit the advancement of human culture and the human population. And that's exactly the sort of crisis that Lincoln was facing. Um, you know, it is the divine right. It's the, look, when you look at someone like the pe people running Davos, the people running BlackRock, I mean, the, uh, I mean, they really do, or, or you look at some of these Silicon Valley types. Um, I mean, they really do have this sort of divine right of kings outlook. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, we are the elite. We are, we're billionaires. We run these institutions. Your governments don't mean anything. Your elected, you know, offices don't mean anything. We know what is best for the world. You know, it's the divine right of kings. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what they intend to enforce upon us now, you know? Um, yeah, no, that's good. And I think, you know, I think the, um, well, I think this has been a good discussion. I mean, I think it's, there's, there's, I think people get the idea um, and that what Lincoln does is a unique American expression. Um, I've heard it referenced before with the response to the Great Depression the American people responded with a Lincoln reflex. It was not a, a response to the way Europe had with fascism. Franklin Roosevelt recognized that. He, he referenced the throwing the money changers out of the temple. He brought back that cherished sense of, of a worship of a true God and a true humanity. Um, and we were successful at fighting a war across two oceans. Yeah. Um, well, let me just, can I interrupt one second? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Why don't, yeah, why don't you make some final comments here? People say, people may take a sec, uh, exception to this idea that we shouldn't organize around economic program or something. You know, I mean, I read this thing, I said this thing about Lincoln and Henry Carey in 1857, where they disagreed. But look, in, people look at Franklin Roosevelt and say, well, he, he did all these economic things. But look, look at, look at what he did. Look at the movement that brought him into office. In November of, of 1832, um, Lincoln didn't, uh, Roosevelt didn't say, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. What he said was, I'm going to rescue the forgotten men and women of America. I'm going to rescue the, I'm going to stand for the forgotten man. Now, in a, in a very real sense, that's, that's what Lincoln meant. Or it, you could you could you could subsume that in what Lincoln meant when he said, "We're going to build our movement on the Declaration of Independence." Because what is the Declaration of Independence? All men, all men and women, are created equal, right? And and what what Roosevelt did was was really it's different words. It's a different century, but it's the same impulse. America stands for its people because the people are the product, are, 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 you know, the people are how you create the future, you know? Um, and uh, 
And really, this is what Roosevelt did. Yeah. This is what he did. And it's what we have, we have today. We have a Lincoln reflex in the population. And um, I think you said the next discussion is going to be on uh, national sovereignty and the, and the greenbacks. Greenbacks and national banking. National banking. Okay, so uh, we're going to take up this in more advanced terms. I think the economic fight in principle. Um, but I think this has been a, um, a, a discussion to highlight because it's, it's really gotten at the substance of things. So do you have any closing remarks? No, I have no closing remarks except uh, to remind people that if you have a question or a comment, please email us at podcast at LaRoucheNet.net. Um, and we would be, uh, we'll take some of these questions up probably uh, at some point later in this series of podcasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds good. And I'm very happy to uh, be with you all here today. Great. Thanks, Bob. So please send your comments or questions to podcast at LaRoucheNet.net. And um, stay, stay tuned for the number five next week on greenbacks and national banking. And um, let's, let's return our nation to its true principles and bring those principles to all of mankind. So have a good night. Have a good weekend. And we'll talk soon. Bye.